Okay. Hello, my name is Andrea Brownstein. I'm the chair of the board for New Creation International, a um, institution that supports integral education in its practices and principles. Uh, among the things we do are to work with teachers and students in the St. Louis area, and we support a school in India that is based on the principles of Sri Aurobindo's uh, integral education. Um, it is an ongoing process that allows us to train people, help institute practices within schools, and support the um, improvement of the school in India. That's it. So I'm going to read from um, Sri Aurobindo's piece on a system of national education, which was first published in the Karma Yoga, and it's his first principle of education. It's in a, an article titled The Human Mind. The first principle of true teaching is that nothing can be taught. The teacher is not an instructor or taskmaster. He is a helper and guide. His business is to suggest and not to impose. He does not actually train the pupil's mind. He only shows him how to perfect his instruments of knowledge and helps and encourages him in the process. He does not impart knowledge to him. He shows him how to acquire knowledge for himself. He does not call forth the knowledge that is within. He only shows him where it lies and how it can be habituated to rise to the surface. The distinction that reserves this principle for the teaching of adolescent and adult minds and denies its application to the child is a conservative and unintelligent doctrine. Child or man, boy or girl, there is only one sound principle of good teaching. Difference of age only serves to diminish or increase the amount of help and guidance necessary. It does not change its nature. Now at first, this seems almost like a shocking assertion that the, the first principle of teaching is that nothing can be taught. Um, in my view, this points out two principal things. The, significance of the nature of the individual and the great responsibility which the person in the teaching role has to that individual, adult or child. It also points out that um, we come into the world with certain attributes uh, which comprise our nature and we can see these as the, all the elements of the outer personality and also the, the significance too is very pre prominent of the inner being, um, the, the soul in essence, and how this relates to the outer nature and the inner nature, because the inner nature is multi-layered. Um, Without going on into the other principles, um, I think just reflecting on what comprises the individual. So we have the outer personality, the senses. Sri Aurobindo emphasizes the significance of the senses of our perception, our mind, our, our sensory elements. Uh, and then we, we get in later in his, in developing the educational theory to training these senses. But there's also, in addition to the outer nature and these elements, sensory elements, there is the, um, the, in the inner being, we can see this as the soul and we can see it also as the subconscious. Because the subcon we come with certain subconscious elements attached to us that relate to our heredity, uh, our environment, uh, the generations that have come before us, uh, all there sort of comprising elements of the individual. And then also there's, Sri Aurobindo describes the subliminal, which is something that's not always recognized in modern psychology, which is 
this has lower aspects which relate to the subconscious and then it has higher aspects which relate to higher planes of being. And this is something that's always act as, active in us, whether we're awake or asleep. But when we're awake, it's not engaged by the conscious mind. But this uh, subliminal consciousness opens the way to great capacities. And um, it's not stifling that awareness, keeping that communication um, open and being sensitive to that and especially in childhood um, has a great effect on the capacity for learning and, and what can be learned what's there within the child um, i have a background in in classical studies latin and so forth and so to say nothing can be taught um, sort of for me speaks to the uh, to the Latin meaning of the word education. It's, it means literally to draw out. Now, Shurabindo says not to draw out so much as to enable to emerge. So I think that's something that we can be aware of as we discuss integral education. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. <laughs> I thought it was fascinating what you just talked about having a background in the classics, because as you were speaking, I was trying to sort in my mind the difference between learning or teaching and training. So it's possible to train people to do all kinds of things, march in order. Uh, you can train them to, I don't know, behave under certain circumstances. You can teach someone Latin or Greek, but they have to learn the classical world once they've got a tool. So I know for sure that I don't know the classical world, but once I've read the Odyssey in English in five different translations, I can learn something about what the mental landscape is that they can't teach me directly. So I think it's, it's pretty interesting to try to separate out that inner directed joy that comes from discovering something yourself, but only when you build on enough tools so you can take it apart and look at it. So I was really glad to hear your example. Um, and also just one more thing and then I'll let somebody else talk. Um, we have a teacher at MICDS who used to talk to the students about the liminal states and they would nod their heads. <laughs> and they thought he was nuts because no one ever talked about liminal states to them. And then they went away to college and learned something about psychology and philosophy and came back to him and said, it's a real thing. This is really great. So he taught them something, but it wasn't a building, it was only a building block for them to understand true liminal states later on when they got more um, knowledge about the world that they had actually explored themselves. So very rich kind of conversation. Thank you so much for bringing those things up. And uh, it, it's very, uh, it's interesting to hear this is these different perspectives because I read something different in this principle, first principle, but different in the sense complementary, not not uh, in, in in contrast with what you already both you Andrea and Marta already said, uh, because I always all, all was also a bit. Mm, when I first read this principle, nothing can be taught. I said, well, mm, this doesn't, didn't re resonate at first with my intellectual mind and teacher centered mind in the classical sense. But when I became then a teacher, uh, I noticed that in fact, it's true that those students, those children, I had more teenagers from, 15 in the high school, so I call them students, but whatever. Those students who um, were more successful um, with the, in the learning process uh, were those who internalized more or less subliminally, not subconsciously, subliminally, um, who internalized that they can learn only if they teach themselves. 
And that's, the, I think, one of the important objectives of integral education. Uh, the, that we enable the children, the students, to learn by themselves. In fact, those students who performed bet better were those who decided to take up their own learning process and uh, by their own initiative uh, made the reading, the research, the exercise, the ho homework or whatever, without the teacher's figure telling what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and so on. And, and so uh, these were those who decided to acquire, to, to acquire, um, to acquire the knowledge by themselves or something like that. No? But that's one thing that in fact I learned also. And I think here also changes a lot the role of the teacher. The role, and this is also a thing that is maybe quite hard for most teachers who are in the classical teaching school uh, mindset uh, that it is, their role is not so much to teach and uh, impose knowledge. Uh, rather, it is that to be helpers. I, I like to call them mentors uh, or guides uh, um, who stand by and eventually also interfere somehow in the learning process, but only when asked by the children, not always saying what they have to, 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 to do. And it is someone who helps and encourages and guides uh, um, to acquire the knowledge by, uh, for themselves. So uh, I think that, so nothing can be taught, but I can, I think you, we, we can teach ourselves. Learning the teaching to ourselves is the most fulfilling and productive way of learning. So that's my take, at least for now. So we have um, Chaitanya, who studied in Sri Bindo International Center of Education. So I would like to share her experience and practice with her own four-year-old now. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Lakshmi. Yeah, um, before I share my experience with my four-year-old, um, I'd probably, I mean, I'd like to um, take both the points, I mean, all the points that I've heard so far. Um, I'd like to actually show from my own practical experience in the um, Shrebin International Center of Education where I studied. If you just look at the first principle, where um, nothing can be taught, um, but you know, um, everything is there within. So in, you must have heard about the school, how it is taught, but being there, like I have seen how it is uh, in terms of how the teachers, um, teachers, they're different, the, uh, the different ways. Like there are some classes where it is quite similar, where there are some particular assignments which are given to you and then you go back um, you know, with the assignment, it's very similar to what you see in the Western education or also a bit in the Indian system. But there's the beauty of it is the amount of freedom that is given where you're given a choice to choose what you want to do. And, um, and there are some particular um, age group where there's a lot of flexibility given. It's not in the initial years, but later, maybe around, um, you know, higher education, um, like 11th and 12th or 10th standard where it's more project-based learning and i think that is where the true learning comes where the student learns to teach himself and the teacher is not like an instructor but more like a guide who is um, you come up with your ideas your thoughts and they are just enabling you to think further and get a better you know understanding of the subject that you choose and uh, I personally always felt that that was the best way of learning for me. And in fact, the beauty um, of it was they, uh, there was also a flexibility where they saw that there were some students who were um, ready for free progress. The free progress system where you're given the 
like Marco has written about free progress, so he, he would know, uh, you know, uh, the idea of free progress very well and he would tell us better maybe about it um, later. So they used to choose some people who had that mindset where they were better in learning for themselves when they're given the freedom, they could choose their own subject, own project and learn their own way at their own pace. But there were others, there'll always be the other set who prefer to be instructed, who like it in a very uh, structured way. There would be some mindsets like that. We were always, um, you know, um, gauged based on our capability and our interests. And that balance was struck, which was very beautiful. Um, and later when I moved from the ashram school to the regular um, um, Indian system of education. I, I did my master's in, uh, in a central university in Bondi University. It was completely a contrast. It's rote le learning where everything is like literally taught to you, dictated to you and you have to go by it. So I got to see the other side of it and I knew how I fit into that. I do not fit into that at all. But again, when I came to the US, I had studied here further and um, I enjoyed it a lot because again, a lot of flexibility was given whereas where you choose, it's more project-based learning. So this was just an example to share that, um, you know, uh, nothing can be taught uh, going by that word. The main thing is, I think freedom is a very important thing that is given to the learner, the child or the adult or whoever is learning um, where the person is uh, has the choice to choose what you want and you try to learn in your own way instead of somebody else kind of deciding what is it that you need to learn and how is it that you need to learn and that's where my son comes in I have a four-year-old and uh, I think I've never learned more in my life than now now what I'm learning because being a parent and a teacher is uh, it's very hard and you learn a lot so he is in an age where he understands some things, doesn't understand some things. And I can see how sometimes I impose myself on him and I say, no, this is how it is. And I have to keep correcting myself and, you know, step back because that's where you realize that they are four, but they know everything. They know better than you. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And uh, so he teaches me every day uh, to show me that, you know, that this is not the stage where you, uh, you just suggest you do not impose and uh, let him learn for himself. So I see that with every little thing that I experience with him. You know, um, for example, if he's playing with a Play-Doh or something and I try to uh, show him that, you know, this is going to be really, it's going to make a mess. So can you do it in a different way, please? Then he would like, he would always tell me, wait, and he would actually take his own time and he would come up with something really artistic and beautiful. And my mind is more about the mess at that point when I see some things, but then if I can just ease out and wait, then I see what is the beautiful thing that he creates. So that's all. It's just a little example of how, you know, learning and learning comes um, without our interference and imposing uh, and how creative minds develop. So yeah, just a little example of that. Thank you, Leitu. I just wanted to make um, one remark. I know freedom, I think um, I would learn freedom with responsibility for all yes. of you. Absolutely, that is true. Yes. So we have Mira, I'd like to share her views. Uh, hi, actually my background is in early childhood education. So this is uh, mostly to do with the, uh, with the young children. And so Shirvinda talks about guiding the children to perfect their instruments of knowledge and help and encourage them. And so this is about what the teachers can do is they can bring objects that the children are interested in and help them to observe keenly more, uh, you know, they can use their senses to observe, you know, the different aspects of smell, touch, taste, and sound. And then they can also observe their external characteristics such as size, shape, and, uh, you know, and, and, the, and the different shades of color. And um, they can also look at the, internal characteristics and see what it is made out of and how it works and see if there are any patterns in it. And, and also their children, you know, they can observe the, um, and the, they can estimate the length and the width of the object and draw the object and then compare the object with some other object and make connections that way. And so the children are learning by themselves and the teacher is there to help them, to guide them, to answer any questions that they have. And, you know, it just, it just becomes a part of them 
And whenever they see another object like similar to that or just any object, they learn to observe very keenly and thus learn you know, by themselves while the teacher is just you know, helping and guiding them. And so this takes us to Shervindo's principle of the teacher showing him where the knowledge lies and how it can be habituated to rise to the surface. And so uh, it's just, it's, I think it's a, it's a very good way. We are trying to implement this in, in Sherbindo school in, in India. In, uh, and so we're just in the, you know, in the initial stages and we'll see how it works. And, but we're hoping that it'll be very, very, uh, the children will enjoy learning this way and uh, just you know, adapt to it. And I thank you. Come on, uh, Andrea, from your experience, um, seeing different evolutions in education <laughs> in the last you know, four decades or five well, decades. <laughs> of course, I, I believe that the first principle is the true uh, statement of how human beings learn. You really have to say, I, and I, I love your statement about saying, show them objects they're interested in and then show them where the knowledge lies and let them find that. Um, Project-based experiences have become very popular uh, in American education recently. We certainly have had them at MICDS. The people who understand project-based learning really can make it sing. People who don't have experience with it think it's just playing around. So, but you have to, you have to start doing that. I'm going to use one experience from my uh, long teaching career. Uh, currently, there is a course at MICDS called uh, Literary Explorations or something that is based on a project that um, I started quite a while ago that was called the Author Project. Uh, and, uh, I began it in a time when it was more uh, the, the common experience was to assign an author to a student, let us say Jane Austen or Herman Melville, and say, okay, go find out about this author and tell us why it's important. And of course that meant going to a library and looking up things that didn't mean much and then writing a really boring paper about it and getting your grammar corrected. Well, I had a class in poetry and I assigned my kids to investigate a poet, a poem, a poet, and make, begin to re make a reading of it and do a report. I had a student come in close to the time when the, it was due to say, ha, huh, I didn't do any work on this at all. And I said, oh, really? You know, smart, wise ass kid in the Gold Coast of Chicago. He said, no, I just found Linda Paston's phone number and I called her up and I said, so tell me about this poem that you wrote and tell me what you meant. And what about this? <laughs> I said, Good, glad you didn't do any work about that. <laughs> so out of that grew the idea that the kids could, could look around for an author that hadn't been sort of canonized yet. They could write a letter to that author, ask them questions, read several things by that author, and come to their own literary judgment about that author. They learned fabulous amounts of things about the uh, personal attitudes and um, processes of many different writers and all of them came to their own conclusions about what it was literature meant and what those authors were about. It was a wonderful experience to see kids how to go, oh, had one kid who heard um, Saul Bellow had gotten a, an award here and the young man wrote in his paper, well, I heard Saul Bellows tell us in the audience, it was really important for young people to learn to read carefully and critically, and they should take a serious in, uh, interest in literature. So I wrote him a letter at the University of Chicago, and his secretary wrote back and said, he said, oh, thus I was surprised when his secretary wrote back and said, Mr. Bellow has no time to speak to you. <laughs> so <laughs> guess what? Um, that, that kind of long-term investment in, in real learning and real project was the best thing kids did all that year. And they came back year after year to say, I remember what my author project was. I remember what I learned from it. Um, I've got a million stories like that, but I'll let Saul Bellow do the one. So, so I like, I thought it was very 
I think it's really true that you need to be able to give people tools. I'm thinking of somebody being taught how to do fly fishing, for example, which I can't do. Um, but once they have the tools and they are faced in the direction of using those tools, the actual learning really happens then. Um, that's enough of my stories for now. Thanks, Andrea. <laughs> Anyone else wants to share any views? <laughs> Uh, I eventually wa wanted also to add something about this concept of freedom. This is very important, in fact, because I hear frequently that we speak about the idea of freedom, freedom, freedom. Yes, great. But in fact, you're right, Lakshmi. Freedom with responsibility. This is also a very important point that even grown-ups uh, sometimes uh, don't realize and don't understand. There's this, uh, this idea that freedom is that I can do whatever I want to do. And I worked in a school uh, um, where this concept was lived in a wrong way, uh, where somehow as teachers, we were not able to transmit this idea that yes, we are free, but we must also be responsible. There was only the concept of freedom. And this had quite a fired back. And the reaction from the teachers was then to return back to an authoritarian behavior. So if we don't have a clear understanding of what freedom is, there is a risk that things spiral down again. So I think it's very important that we also understand that the concept of freedom of free progress education in, in integral education is a concept of freedom with responsibility. And then there is also the question freedom of what or who. Because in integral yoga, you know, that there are these planes and parts of the being. Uh, is it the freedom of the ego? Is it the freedom of the, the, the emotional body? Uh, is it the freedom who is free? No? So, and here we come also to the question of vital education, that is the education to deal in an appropriate way with our emotions, uh, the freedom in, in, in integral education is not that freedom of our impulses, uh, every impulse. Uh, it is, at bottom, it is the freedom of the soul. Uh, but what this means is a bit more complicated thing that perhaps goes a bit beyond the first principle. So this, my little bit about the concept of freedom that I would like to point out and that should not be misunderstood. This reminds me of the principle of self-control, uh, which is, is so important. And I remember there's a story of uh, teachers from the ashram school coming to the mother and uh, being concerned about, uh, they were describing some reports too, of children being not fully under control and asking for advice about discipline. And um, in the same manner, nothing can be taught in the same theme, really. Mother said to them, if I understand it correctly, and I believe I do, that the self-control has to come from the teacher. If the teacher herself or himself has self-control, that will be conveyed to the students and, and, and really modeled for them, but also they will get the sense of that self-control. And so in that way, that's the ideal discipline. It, it's all about the model. And <laughs> your four-year-old has a model. You like that he makes beautiful things, but he also has to clean up. Yes. My grandson is, has not the self-control to not fall over he has to know that's really not going to work very well. I think, remember the word disciple means to follow through 
loyalty and af affection and belief. So the discipline comes from following the right model. I, I think one of the reasons I'm really happy that um, New Creation works with parents and teachers is that the parents are really the first models. And they sometimes they know it and sometimes they're too young or they're too distracted and they just get too tired. We need to have their own self-awareness and their own mindfulness as well as knowing that there is no moment, not one minute where those kids aren't watching ever. Yeah. Because for children, it's a continuation at home and the balance between home and school. So um, I really liked, uh, you know, what Martha pointed out. I think that's such an important point that um, we keep reminding ourselves as uh, new parents um, that, you know, the mother, I mean, we always get back to the mother's books for guidance uh, in teaching and being as a parent also. And as you said, she would always point it back to the parents and teachers. She would never point a finger at the students. Um, so that's where it comes, you know, the, when I talk about freedom, I was giving the example. It's not that you just let go, give freedom and go. That's where the teacher comes in. Of course, the child has to be taught to be responsible also, but at an early age, they do not understand it till they see the consequences of things sometimes. But uh, that's where the, the, you know, the teacher and the guide's role comes, where you can point out and make them aware of, see, when you do this, this is what happens. That's, that's, that's how we, um, and there will be repeated uh, errors. It will be the same thing sometimes which are repeated, like I can see with my son. Uh, and sometimes even tested out, like he tests me, he knows what he's going to do is, uh, it's not the right thing. And he will literally do it and look at me. Um, so those are times when it gets really challenging for me. But uh, I think that's where the self-control comes for me. And, um, you know, it is, it's not just about um, saying it's also a state. I have seen very often that if I'm in the right state, if he may be doing some error, uh, something, either, you know, making a big mess or doing something dangerous, which he shouldn't, he could hurt himself. And just taking an example of my son, because, you know, any student, it's just the same, because I see it right now at home happening. The, the day when I do not have that self-control, there's no way I can get him to understand it. But the day I know that I'm in the right state and I'm poised and I'm able to tell him in the right way, or even I don't have to tell him if I, if I just have that presence and, you know, I'm able to have that balance, it automatically transfers to him. And I think that's what the guide's role is. It is not so much of all the time saying, uh, it's also the state that you have within you that can, that can really transfer to the student or the child. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's again, um, adult being a role model, parents and teachers. And it's a balance between home and school. And that's where the foundation starts. I like, Mar Marco, I really like your comments about freedom and responsibility because I think, um, I, I remember when I learned about the social contract, which was somewhere around grade nine or grade eight, but people seem to have forgotten that, that responsibility means to respond to things in your environment. And to be responsible means behave properly toward them. Um, doesn't seem like doesn't seem like a hard lesson, but boy, we have lost it somewhere. I really feel like getting out and making lectures somewhere, but I'm not. Thank you, Andrea, about the, the etymology of responsibility. I never thought about that. It's it's, it's quite uh, deep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I spend my life in my head. I'm so <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I too, but I never thought about this, 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 this word as such. It's interesting, yes. Um, just a word uh, about the um, role models of teachers in a school. I think what is also very important is that also teachers among them, the teacher, the community of teacher, uh, ag how, how can I say, not, not necessarily agree, but they feel well among themselves right they share. I, yeah i unfortunately lived an experience with teacher fa fought against mm -hmm. each other and then went to the class teaching 
you, you, you bring something in the classroom which is negative, a negative, something negative, and you, and you can mm, mm, try to hide it however you want, uh, in, in whatever w way you would like to mask it, but it comes through and you feel it that it comes through. But Absolutely. so this is also, I think, an important point in, in, in the context of integral education. Also, maybe mm, Chaitanya has more to teach, to tell us about that also, Martha, uh, how to have a good relationship between teachers, uh, the, 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 the dynamics, the social dynamics of the teachers is also very important, I think. No doubt of it. What you look to is the leadership of the school. Leaders either encourage a culture of um, interaction beyond just whatever you're teaching. You know, you have you have conversations, you have lunch together, you celebrate things. I know of another school in St. Louis who believes that identifying the professional teacher means putting that person in the classroom and not bothering them. Don't 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 fuss with that person. But there's no collegiality. There's no sharing. There's no humor. It's not as much fun to be in that school as it is in a place where you something a little more pleasant, like popping in each other's classroom and sharing a joke, or you know, sending one kid to another teacher because that person can do a different kind of job. So, I certainly agree. Collegiality is certainly important. That's and a, a leader for the school that emphasizes that, that and gives value to that can make a big difference. Having shared goals, uh, sort of a, a shared inspiration, uh, which of course is not easy to maintain, <laughs> but except in the uh, spiritual community. But even so, having a shared set of ideals is... I, I think that a perfect. school is a spiritual community as well. I mean, we don't have a professed deity, but we do have, as you say, an inspiration. In Christian uh, churches, they say that there's such a thing as a preacher's seven. Once the preacher's been there for seven years, if he hasn't made any changes, it's time for him to go because he said what he has to say. Leaders in schools are the same way. If they don't grow, they need to leave after about seven or eight years because they've said it. But the people who grow bring their faculty along with them. So I, I think it's a very spiritual experience. I think you make a very good point there, Andrea, that uh, you know, any collective really is a spiritual collective. Um, yeah, right. It has to be because we all meet and we really converge at that level, whether we recognize it or not. So that's, that's very fine to give that prominence. Keeps you going. <laughs> Need all the help we can get, right? <laughs> Good motivation. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I think that um, it truly is, was the fact that my faculty friends kept me going, but also it's true that the kids themselves keep you going because they're the ones who, when they are on the track you've described, that is, they have found a way to make their knowledge grow. They can help you grow. So it's, true. it's, I mean, why else would you spend all those hours, all those years carrying around bags of papers you have to grade? <laughs> <laughs> and read all those meetings, anyway. Yeah. So thank you. Anybody has any other thoughts? And <laughs> Just one thought uh, from what Marco was saying. I don't think um, I have much experience to share about integral education, how the teachers can uh, help, but just a thought that um, I think sharing helps a lot. If, um, you know, um, if you can have some forums where you can share with the teachers, it's also um, where you have to create a fraternity with, with the, within the teachers. There should be a good friendship and, and that just doesn't come. It's a very co competitive world. Um, outside like um, it's different um, in the ashram I don't think we ever felt studying in the Shrebinder International Center of uh, Education we never felt the competitive nature of things because 
was completely on different um, uh, it's a different level altogether uh, where the competition somehow doesn't touch people you know but outside i can see it's very hard it's very competitive so if you can break that with creating a, some uh, some kind of friend um, understanding between the teachers it's more like uh, camaraderie than just like competing that i'm a better teacher and i get better grades for my uh, students i i think it really helps uh, where do you share with each other instead of trying to just monopolize and keep your own knowledge for yourself to do better with your class you can create an environment like that uh, as martha said i think leadership really helps and having some guidelines and some kind of things that Uh, when you have a meeting um, some uh, would you say i don't know um, yeah mission or vision not every school probably has in the same ways but there yeah, are guidelines is a simple word which you can go by those are my thoughts thank you i think it applies to parents to um just to kind of learn from each other you know different kids go to different schools but um, just having like a support group to understand their own children mm-hmm. yeah uh, i i i can relate a lot to what you said chetanya <laughs> because in fact uh, first of all i would say the, the words collegiality and fraternity that's exactly without competition that's mm-hmm. exactly what is needed among teachers and because also among teachers everyone of us, uh, of us has something to offer has stra- uh, strength but also some weaknesses the competition tries there i have then this um, attitude where i try to repress my weaknesses and by repressing my weaknesses i make them even stronger and <laughs> and uh, yeah because it's so uh, i think it's not a normal mechanism and it, it try to then compete with other teachers and i remember very well that i wanted for example we had teachers on the same subject i was a math uh, mathematics and physics teacher and um, i tried also to relate with other my colleagues of the same subject and to exchange experiences because perhaps i can learn something from 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 you and you can learn something from me but no there was a wall and uh, which wanted they they wanted to show that they are the best and they don't need to communicate with us so this kind of atmosphere is something that we absolutely must come away from in a school and this is an aspect that i think if this remains and 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 perpetuates itself it reflects itself more or less subconsciously on all the school environment and then we cannot built up that kind of spiritual community which i think also i agree every group congregation school group uh, ideally should be always a sort of spiritual community in fact <laughs> um if i may just quickly point out another thing that i uh, noticed and i would like sorry what because nothing can be taught was the thing first thing that i found hard to swallow but the second thing that which is still in the, the f- first principle is where shrobindo says there is only one sound principle of good teaching difference of age only served serves to diminish or increase the amount of help and guidance necessary it does not change its nature and this surprised me because i always had this idea that for every age you know i had also this f- f- um, teacher formation of teacher at that age you must do this at that age is this this at that age and it was all in compartments uh, age uh, related education and also that this time i realized in fact this principle of teaching is you needs more or less guidance according to the age but this principle is true throughout all ages and sometimes it's difficult for us to imagine a children a, a child uh, that knows 
by himself or herself what he or she should learn without necessarily someone telling him. And that's uh, different, especially for little children. As adults, I think we should think about this again and reconsider this aspect. I, I agree with you. I, um, I often thought about what it meant for having a very small child know what he should learn. I think what they know is they want to know something and they're, they're presented with a range of things that they can play with. And the play is what tells them where the next thing to do. They can't articulate what it is I need to know. I mean, there are some people who know they have to play the piano when they're three. You know, <laughs> there are some people who know they have to dance. But basically, it is that, as you said, the drawing out of what, what is a natural interest of theirs and then cultivating it. You know, what you, what you feed grows, what you don't feed dies. That's the story. If you want your child to love art, feed art. <laughs> you want your child to love tightrope walking, get them a tightrope, only this far off the floor. So <laughs> I, just, I just think that, um, I think it's, it's a really um, deep insight into the nature of human development that we're never really done. And we start really early when even though adults think that we're just too stupid and too young and too ignorant to want anything. It's not true. Kids want lots of, kids want the, what they want is the gaze of their parents saying, well done. And that has to be for everything. If you've ever seen people walk by babies, they always smile. And there's a reason for that. That's so human beings know they're welcome into the human community. Anyway. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. This has been great, mm -hmm. as usual. Actually, you run the best meetings. Because <laughs> <laughs> all of us collective aspiration, collective <laughs> work together. <laughs>